live on Facebook. I'm Michael Simanchik. Uh, this is Alyssa Bierkel here. We are attorneys of the California Innocence Project. Um, we, I'm uh, the managing attorney and Alyssa is our litigation coordinator. Alyssa was the attorney that worked on the Kimberly Long case and Kim was uh, exonerated, released from prison in June, uh, was recently featured on ABC's 2020. And so we wanted to make it so that our followers out there could ask us questions uh, specifically about the Kim Long case. So uh, Alyssa will talk a little bit about the case, um, talk a little bit about uh, what we've done over the years, including uh, walking 712 miles on her behalf, and also talk about some things that uh, 2020 didn't cover that we think lent uh, additional, uh, it's just additional facts that uh, we think that everybody should know that lends to her being innocent. So, uh, Alyssa? Mm -hmm. Hi everyone. Um, we got Kim's case in this office in about 2009 and we do a top to bottom investigation on this. We have collected every document in this case, every photograph, every interview. We have our hands on everything. Um, and so we have we came to the conclusion that Kim was innocent. We didn't take it lightly. This is something that took years of investigation and tons and tons of work and research and uh, forensic testing and co consulting with experts. So um, we are 100% sure that Kim Wong is innocent and that is the reason we presented our case back to the court. And obviously the judge found our evidence persuasive and reversed her conviction. Um, and it took so long, I see we, we started this case in 2009 and we weren't able to get her out until 2016, not just because of the amount of work we had to do on the case, but because the legal process takes so long. In that time, we filed numerous pleadings in the court and we even um, mm -hmm. took it upon ourselves to ask for clemency from the governor, which we thought might be a quicker way to get Kim out of prison. Um, and, and Mike here and me and my boss Justin had uh, taken clemency petitions and walked them from San Diego to Sacramento to the governor's office asking for Kim to be released and 11 other people who we know are innocent and who are in prison right now. Um, unfortunately, the governor hasn't acted on any of those clemency petitions and through our own efforts, we have been able to get four of those people out so far. So, um, tons of effort and time going to these cases and, and we are an open book with these. These are cases where we are sure they're innocent and so um, we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, and I'm monitoring as the comments come in so feel free to drop a comment on there, ask us some questions about the case. Uh, I know from watching the show with Alyssa that there were some things there that we thought lended some additional, some facts that would have been, uh, I think, helpful to the viewers out there to, uh, to actually kind of help them understand how we, why we think that Kim is innocent. So can you talk uh, about any of those things and, and explain to us why, uh, why our office was so behind Kim in this? Yeah. When we got this case, it initially didn't make sense to us, just if you look at the motive that Kim has here. Here she has a childhood boyfriend who she reconnects with, and she's living with him for only six months. And in that period of time, it just didn't seem like the type of scenario where you would get so mad at someone to kill him. Usually in these domestic violence cases, you have years of built up resentment and anger, sometimes custody issues going on, and that's what ultimately results in the murder. You didn't really have that with Kim. You did, uh, and, and, and so the motive for us was very, very weak. Then you had, in the first jury trial, nine of the jurors thinking that it, there was not enough evidence to convict her. And then in the second trial, the judge saying he didn't think that the evidence was enough to convict her, even though she was convicted. Um, and, and there's reasons for that, because this entire case comes down to the timeline given by Jeff Dills. Had it not been for this timeline, and I think everybody across the board agrees on this, even the prosecutors, had it not been for Jeff saying he dropped her off 39 to 49 minutes before that 911 call came in, this case would have gone nowhere. There would be no evidence against Kim. Um, and so even if you look at that timeline, to come up with all of the different things Kim would have to do in that timeline, it would be impossible for her to do. She'd have to come home, she'd have to get so mad at Ozzy that she would become homicidal. She would have to 
hit him in, in his head a number of times, even though she was highly intoxicated and had taken Vicodin pills. And she'd have to be very precise about it and with enough force to actually kill him. Then she'd have to clean up. And the cleanup process is where the timing really comes in that it would have been impossible. She has to wash and dry her clothes because she's in the exact same clothes that she was wearing earlier in the day. She would have to clean all of the blood off of her body, off of her hair, off of everywhere. This is a tremendously bloody crime scene. And, and every single spout in the home was dry. Not a single water faucet had been turned on, not the shower. And so the prosecutors made this kind of bizarre argument that, oh, well, she must have dipped off in the hot tub outside to wash her body off. But again, it is in the desert, it's cold at night, and there's not a trace of water outside of the hot tub. So then that presents the obvious question of, well, how did she dry off? And what did she do with all these items, the murder weapon, her, uh, you know, the towel that she would have dried off with, where did all of these items go? And now she would have to take all those items, put them into her car, drive them away from the crime scene to an area that law enforcement to this day has not found them. And even though a thorough search had been done of the area looking for the murder weapon and any bloody clothes or anything that, that had to do with this crime, I couldn't find any. But she'd have to dispose of them so well that no one's even able to find them, then come back, then stage the crime scene by disposing of various items, random items around the house, and then call 911 in a panic. So it just doesn't make sense. Timeline-wise, it doesn't make sense. Um, so that was one, one big thing that shows that Kim, Kim didn't do it. And then you have the fact that Jeff Dills, who gives this timeline, was a suspect in the case. He believed that the cops were going to treat this as a love triangle, that Kim and Jeff had come back and killed this guy. And he had every incentive and motive on the planet to distance himself from the time that Kim got home. Because he, if he drops her off 49 minutes before the 911 call comes in, then he's not going to be a suspect. Because then the only person who's with Ozzy is Kim at that time. And I also think that that's a main reason why the officers drop the investigation into any other suspect in the case. Because they could never get around Jeff's timeline. And so they had to go after Kim. Because if he's telling the truth, then she has 49 minutes she can't account for. Uh, we were able to consult with various forensic pathologists in this case. And they had done an analysis based on how the body had been decomposing. And there is, this has been studied for hundreds and hundreds of years, that once a body dies, certain processes start happening in the body, and those aren't visible to the human eye for a period of time. And in this case, Ozzy already had stages of, of decomposition showing, things that could not have been seen in less than an hour. And we know at most Kim has 49 minutes to do this thing. And so we have forensic evidence from pathologists that this body had been dead for a long period of time. In fact, they placed the time of death around 11.30, which was two hours before Jeff said he dropped her off. Um, it, you know, the prosecutor tried to counter that at the hearing by calling in a forensic pathologist who testified, yeah, he, you know, he could have been dead before that, but there's a slight chance he could have been dead after Kim got home. But it's just, it, even his own expert was saying it was more likely that he was dead before Kim even got home. Uh, we had unknown DNA at the crime scene. We had a cigarette butt on the coffee table where, you know, the victim is not smoking, our client's not smoking, and this DNA is, based on the statistics, likely male Hispanic DNA. And we have no idea who that matches to. But we, what we know is that that cigarette butt wasn't there earlier in the day. And cigarette butts have been used to link people to murders across the country for, for decades. So we've got a couple questions. One uh, from a Christine Yu. She says, congrats. Since the sentence is vacated, do we know if the prosecution plans to still pursue the case? The prosecution is appealing the exoneration. They are going through the appeals process right now, and they have indicated to us that they do plan on retrying this case for a third time. And we've got another question from Mike McGranahan. He says, how many years did you work on the case? I worked on the case for seven years. And another question was, what advice do you give to law students on how to be successful, as successful as you? I just, you know, be invested in your cases. And it doesn't matter if you're at the public defender's office, if you're at the prosecutor's office, if you're working for an innocence project, but be invested. 
care about the cause, care about your clients, care about the victims, and just put your heart and soul into these things because that's what it takes. And both of us, by the way, are California Western School of Law graduates. I graduated in 2010, and I was a clinic student in the California Innocence Project uh, from 2008 to 2009. And Alyssa graduated in 2008. She was a student in 2006 and 2007. So keep your, co uh, your comments and questions coming in because we're monitoring them as they come in here. We've got one here, it says, from Freddie, it says, I heard the DA conceded she didn't have blood uh, on her clothes. Do they still believe she's guilty? So Kim, they, the DA's office conceded that Kim did not have blood on her clothing. Do they still think that she's guilty? Yeah, I mean, the theory, the DA's theory at the time that Kim was prosecuted was that she must have changed her clothes because otherwise, you know, she would have had blood on them. In fact, they have conceded that point in our post-conviction hearings. And so I, you know, with that concession, I'm kind of not sure how they're going to proceed with prosecuting her for a third time because one of the critical components of their case was that she had changed her clothes. And even the judge in this case said if she didn't change her clothes, the only reasonable inference is that she cannot be the killer. And that's, that's interesting because not only did they change their theory about that, but now they're, they're trying to figure out what uh, time of death they want to go with. So uh, it certainly seems like uh, the, the prosecution is sort of grasping at anything that they can at this, at this point. Uh, keep your keep your questions coming in, coming in. We uh, we're, we're happy to answer any any of them as they as they pop in the comments. Um, somebody just said, "How can I get in touch with you?" That's a great question. Um, if you want to submit a case to our office, you can do that at CaliforniaInnocenceProject.org. Uh, there's a tab in the top right that says "How to Submit a Case," and you can do it that way. You can do it online uh, for any of your loved ones. We take cases in Southern California, so from San Luis Obispo South, we handle all of those cases. Uh, we do require that the person has already been convicted and sentenced, um, and we do require that you submit uh, a, uh, the appellant's opening brief or the uh, probation officer's report so we have some background into the case. So uh, if you are going to be submitting cases, that is the quickest way to get them through our review processes, get us, get us the questionnaire that you can download from our website and submit the appellant's opening brief all, all at once and, and we'll start the review. So, Yeah, and there's other ways um, if you want to get involved. We have a lot of, um, we are a nonprofit organization, so we are in need of a lot of people to help us out. Um, and so if you're a retired law enforcement, we would love to, you know, have you help us out on these cases or um, we have tons of different volunteer opportunities for attorneys in the community. So if you go to our website, there is a tab to get involved and you can just submit your information and your resume and say how you're interested in getting involved with this. But we really do appreciate help from the community on these cases. That's actually perfectly timed because Sarge Anderson just asked, can I do pro bono hours with the Innocence Project when I'm in law school? And you can. Um, if you go on to volunteer opportunities and attach your resume, you can submit it and it'll go to Raquel Cohen who coordinates our in-office volunteers. Uh, we do take interns from around the world. We had um, students in here from uh, France, Ireland. We always have English that apply. We had a student from UAE apply and um, we've had people from around the world, but we do have a lot of local interns that come in in the fall and spring semesters while they're in their, in their classes at USD or Thomas Jefferson, um, and plenty of students that, that uh, go here to California Western School of Law and make their way into our office, help us screen some cases and figure out wh excuse me, which ones that uh, we want to pursue. We, we have a question here from Catherine Hare. It says, how do you fix IAC? Gosh, you know, I think a big portion of that is training defense attorneys. I think there needs to be more training. I, you know, and uh, we do it as much as we can, go to different offices and present on different issues and cases. But, but a lot of the problems I feel with the public defender's offices is that they are overworked and underpaid. And they will be, like the defense attorney in Kim's case was assigned two death penalty cases at the time of her trial. He was literally picking a jury for a death penalty case two weeks after her, the jury returned a guilty verdict. So it's just, it's, it was an impossible amount of work for him to handle at that time. And so I think there need to be limitations and realistic, you know, yeah, limitations on these defense attorneys' workloads so that they can perform competently in all of their cases. 
Um, and again, training I think is a vital portion of it. I mean, you have some attorneys in the community who don't work in a public defender's office and have not been able to uh, kind of keep up to date on changes in say DNA or forensic sciences because they just don't have the manpower as a one person solo practitioner to actually do that. So I do think that we need to do more training for defense attorneys in the community. And I, and I think there's also a lack of resources. Um, you know, public defenders, are, their offices are, are great because they have an investigator that's assigned, which is fantastic. But if I'm a sole practitioner and I would have to pay out of the money that's being paid to me by my client, then, uh, you know, maybe I don't get an investigator because I think I can do it on my own. So, uh, you know, these are things that uh, are important to go out to the crime scene. We require all our students to go to the crime scene and, and see if there's something that was missed. Uh, by the investigators or the attorney at the time of the crime. Uh, we have another question from a T. Corral Lampkins. How about if someone was forced into taking a plea for something they didn't do out of fear? And we actually have a great case example for that. It's the Brian Banks case, who uh, was facing 41 years to life for a sexual assault he didn't commit, uh, ended up pleading guilty and served five years, two months in prison and four years on parole uh, before we were able to get him exonerated. So those are cases that we will take uh, on a limited basis. If you're already out of custody, you have to be uh, on probation or parole. Otherwise, there's no way for us to challenge the conviction under the California mm -hmm. justice system. And that's true in just about, I think, every state in the country. Uh, but those we do get cases quite often where people plead guilty to crimes they didn't commit. Uh, for a better sentence, uh, for because it's a he said, she said, and um, maybe their lawyer advises them that there's they're going down for something that they you know maybe they that even if they didn't do it they'll still plead guilty and um, we have we do get a lot of those those requests for assistance. So yeah. So keep your comments and and your questions coming. I see we've got uh, a, a decent crowd here, and um, I know it's a little bit slow sometimes to refresh on these comments, but. Um, is there, uh, you know, we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the Innocence March. I think that always is yeah. uh, something that people have questions about. Um, in 2013, Alyssa, Justin, and I, as she said earlier, walked from here, California Western, we started, uh, and we went all the way to Sacramento, and we delivered 12 clemency petitions to Governor Brown. Uh, last Tuesday, we had International Wrongful Conviction Day, and we're happy to report that four of the California 12 have since been released from prison and attended wrongful conviction day and spoke about how uh, you know how tough it was for them in prison for uh, many years as innocent people. Um, one of them was uh, Mike Hanline, who spent 36 years in prison. We had Alan Jimenez, who spent 24 years in prison. Bill Richards, who spent 23 years in prison, and Kim was here as well, who had, who had spent seven years in prison. So. Uh, you might be wondering why we walked to Sacramento. Um, it seems a little bit extreme, but the reason was because with these cases where we were very convinced of these people's innocence, we had two of those cases where judges found them innocent but kept them in on technicalities. So we were literally out of legal options. Um, and so we had actually tried to get a meeting with the governor's office for a really long time for a year or two we've been calling hey can we come up and meet with you guys because clemency is really the the fail safe of our criminal justice system it is what you do when there is nothing else to do and we couldn't get the meeting and so we decided we needed to do something extreme and to get the governor's attention so we did this march um, this walk from San Diego to Sacramento to generate awareness along the way with the public about wrongful convictions and to get the governor's attention and we did get the governor's attention by the time we got to Los Angeles and every news crew on the planet came out um, in Los Angeles. And at that time, the governor's office called us and said, all right, you got your meeting. And uh, we were like looking at each other like, geez, we have to walk the last 500 miles of this because it's still- Jump on a plane and go over. <laughs> but, but we did it, you know, we had committed to the process and we went, we got the meeting with the governor's office. Unfortunately, the meeting was a little disheartening because they told us that they have stacks and stacks of clemency petitions that haven't been acted on since Schwarzenegger. They have rooms full of clemency petitions that just haven't been addressed at all. And so, you know, we did our best to try to say, well, these cases are different. These cases, we will do anything on these cases. We'll fly the witnesses up to you. We will, you can meet with our clients in, in prison, whatever you want to do. 
um, to get these cases moving, and unfortunately that just hasn't happened. Yeah, we've got another question from Kirk Bloodsworth. Thank you, Kirk, for the, for the question. For those of you that don't know, Kirk is an exoneree himself. He said, what is your biggest hardship as a group? Uh, I would say, I think the hardest thing, at least um, for me, is uh, I've had a number of cases that um, mm -hmm. I've met with a client, spent many hours talking to them about their case, dissecting it, and I think that they've been wrongfully convicted. Um, and there's not enough evidence to reverse the conviction uh, in a court. So um, telling someone that uh, you know that that we're going to have to close their case is probably the the biggest hardship that I face. I, I don't know about Alyssa, but that I think is sometimes the hardest thing. And and uh, we did just pass a law that I think is going to help in a lot of those situations. We used to have the highest new evidence standard in the in the country. And we just changed the standard to uh, a much uh, lower standard that is actually on par with 46 states in the United States. So I do think that there's going to be less of having to tell them um, that there's nothing we can do. In fact, we're, gonna, we're going back and looking at cases that um, we've investigated that we believe there could be uh, enough evidence now to meet the, the standard that the rest of the country has. But I'm not sure about it. What she thinks. Yeah, I think all of these cases are really tough. I mean, you're dealing with some of the most extreme crimes. You're dealing with the rapes and the murders. The and it, and it's really difficult. And it it's not, you know, for me, I, I feel really terrible for all the victims in these cases. And I, I feel like sometimes they they get lost in in these exonerations because they it's an injustice not just to the person who went into prison for this crime, but it is an injustice to the victim and to their families because now you've taken you've you've ripped open a wound that was healing and and now we're at a stage at least in Kim's case where we don't know who did it and i know that that has to be really really tough on the on the families of the friends of the victim and for me that can take a toll when i'm when i'm thinking about what impact this has in a broad way um, the other thing is in these cases you know we it is very tragic that this person has gone to prison for a crime they didn't do, but there's so much collateral damage to that too. These people have children. Kim had two children at the time, parents, friends, and family. And so when these wrongful convictions happen, it, it's literally like a bomb went off and then the, the chaos and disaster spreads out for miles. And, and so it's just, it's knowing that and how big these cases really are, and not just that this is a legal issue that we're trying to get someone out, but these are real humans with real lives, and, and, and it's a lot to handle. There's a, there's a lot of emotions going in from every direction. We got another question from Sarge Anderson again. Does the California Innocence Project do any lobbying at the state level? Um, so we don't, I wouldn't say that we do lobbying, but we definitely do a lot of advising uh, to the uh, to all of the state the state senators um, when we're telling them what the problems are that we incur with the system um, the new evidence law certainly we we talked to both Senator Joel Anderson who was just here for wrongful conviction day and presented us with recognition from the Senate uh, as well as Senator Mark Leno um, both of them have been champions of justice for us uh, in passing laws to help to fix the system and we've been uh, able to kind of educate them about what the problems are that we in, um, encounter when we're doing the casework that we're doing. Um, in 2015, we passed, with the help of uh, Mark, Leno, Mark Leno, Senator Leno, uh, a false evidence law that changed the, the, the law was, um, was set so that if you have false evidence that's presented mm -hmm. against you at trial, and had that false evidence not been presented, the result of the trial would have been different. That's the way that the law was structured. And the California Supreme Court in 2013 uh, took a position that if an expert were to recant their testimony, that wouldn't be false evidence. So an expert gets up and testifies that you leave a bite mark, it was you, you're the defendant, you definitely left a bite mark on a victim, and now that expert recants that testimony and says, no, no, it actually wasn't that defendant that left a bite mark. In fact, I'm not sure it's a bite mark at all. It might not have been a bite mark at all. That recant wouldn't have classified as false evidence according to the California Supreme Court. And to get around that issue, we talked to Senator Leno about it and explained how ludicrous we thought that was. And he went ahead and came up with a bill 
and um, and and got it pushed through, and it ended up it ended up passing. And soon thereafter, we filed. That was actually that law was named after Bill Richards for his uh, wrongful conviction, and it was ultimately his case. And we filed, and uh, were able to get him out of prison in June. So, um, I wouldn't say that we're we're doing lobbying because. Uh, it's it's more advising them what the problem is with the cases that we encounter. Uh, so, we've got a couple other questions. What's one thing that you think would help end wrongful convictions in the criminal justice system? One thing. One thing. Gosh, that's tough to say. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't. No I don't thing. know. I mean, it's the same if you're looking at okay, what. What's one thing you could do to present, prevent car crashes? You know, we're humans, we make errors, and so I, I'm i not sure that there's one particular thing that would end it. Um, there's a number of things that could help. Like California just passed a law that in homicide cases, the interrogations have to be videotaped now, which is good for everyone. It's good for, for the police officer who said the guy confessed. If the guy said, oh no, I didn't really confess in there. It's good for our analysis to see if, if this was a coerced confession. Um, I think that having more resources available for full-blown investigations is really critical. You know, a lot of these cases, a thorough investigation just wasn't done, and a lot of it comes down to money. Um, I think that there needs to be change in the way that identification procedures are administered. I mean, everyone saw that dress going around for a long time, of whether it was white or gold or blue and black. And that alone shows everyone that we've got serious problems with the way that we make identifications. Like, we can't even agree on the color of a dress while we're looking at it for an hour. So I think um, there's a number of things that can be put in place to make sure that, mm -hmm. that there's a less chance of a wrongful conviction, but as far as eliminating it, I, I'm not sure that's possible. I want to recap. We are uh, both attorneys at the California Innocence Project at California Western School of Law. Uh, we're both California Western graduates. I graduated in 2010, and I'm the managing attorney here. And Alyssa Bierkel graduated in 2008, and she is our litigation coordinator. Uh, we've been talking to you live from our office. Uh, we started talking about the Kim Long case, and Kim, who was uh, exonerated in June, uh, we talked a little bit about that. I, I've got a lot of comments here asking questions about how to volunteer, how to submit cases. You can do all of that at our website, which is CaliforniaInnocenceProject.org. Again, that's CaliforniaInnocenceProject.org. So go to our website if you want to volunteer or if you have cases to submit to us. Um, and I do want to make a, uh, just one comment that to be, please be patient if you do submit a case to us because these cases take a really, really long time for us to get to. We have hundreds of cases that are just waiting for an attorney to review. And, and that's the reason, it goes back to the, the fact that we are a nonprofit organization, we have a small staff, and we are trying to give every case a really thorough look. So if you do submit a case to us, just know that it is gonna be a long process and it is gonna take a long time, but we will get to reviewing your loved one's case. One last comment, I see Larry Polschneider is uh, commenting there. He's a, an exoneree. He'll be celebrating his one year anniversary of being free tomorrow. Uh, so congratulations on your nearly one year of being free. Uh, Larry, for those of you that don't know, is an exoneree out of the Northern California Innocence Project, who is our sister organization working out of Santa Clara. Uh, Larry, congrats on, on one year of, nearly one year of freedom after 15 years for a crime you did not commit. So uh, that is, I think, where we're going to leave it. So we'll do another one of these probably in the next month or so. So. Stay tuned, and uh, thank you guys all for, your, for submitting your comments and your questions. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, hashtag exonerate.